fire made us human, fossil fuels made us modern, now we need a new fire that makes us safe, secure, and durable. So at Rocky Mountain Institute, we are aiming to shift the United States, for starters, completely from oil and coal to efficient use and renewable energy. In our new peer-reviewed uh, grand synthesis called Reinventing Fire, uh, details how saving and displacing fossil fuels can work better and cost less than buying and burning them. Now, four-fifths of the world's energy still comes from burning four cubic miles a year of fossil fuels, the rotted remains of primeval swamp goo. They have built our civilization, they've created our wealth, they've enriched the lives of billions, but now they're rising costs to our security, economics, health, and environment are eroding, if not outweighing their benefits. So we need a new fire. That, this is what our energy system <clears throat> looks like now. It is disconnected, aging, insecure, and inefficient. It needs refurbishment. Switching from the old fire to the new fire uh, has two big shifts in it, one in oil, one in electricity, and they are distinct. Less than 1% of our oil, but 95% of our coal, makes electricity. Oil and power stations each release two-fifths of all the fossil carbon going in the air, and uh, three-fourths of oil fuels our mobility, our transportation, while three-fourths of electricity powers our buildings. The rest of the oil and electricity uh, power factories. So very efficient uh, transportation and buildings and factories save a lot of oil and coal and also save natural gas that can displace both of them. The system we envisage for 2050 uh, is efficient, connected, secure, and distributed. Super efficient autos, buildings, factories will all rely on a secure, modern, uh, and resilient electricity system. And there will be need, no need for uh, oil or coal or even nuclear energy uh, once efficiency and renewables have ended our addiction to fossil fuels. Creating the core industries of this new energy era could cost $5 trillion less in net present value than business as usual and yet support a 158% bigger U.S. economy in 2050. And this transition will need no new inventions, no new federal taxes, mandates, subsidies, or laws, and running Washington gridlock. And it assumes that carbon emissions and all other hidden costs, all externalities, are worth zero, a conservatively low estimate. Uh, let me say this again. I'm going to tell you how to... Uh, how, how the United States can get completely off oil and coal, $5 trillion cheaper with no act of Congress led by business for profit. In other words, this energy solution will be designed and driven by the C-suite, not by K Street. And whether you care most about profits and jobs and competitive advantage or about national security or about public health and environmental stewardship, reinventing fire makes sense and makes money. General Eisenhower reputedly said that uh, expanding the boundaries of a tough problem makes it soluble by encompassing more options and more synergies. So in reinventing fire, we integrate all four energy using sectors, uh, transportation, buildings, industry, and electricity, and also four kinds of innovation in technology, design, policy, and strategy. And these combinations yield far more than the sum of their parts, especially in deeply disruptive business innovations. Including its hidden economic and military burdens, oil is costing our economy upwards of $6 billion a day, a sixth of the whole GDP. Automobiles use three-fifths of our mobility fuel, so how can we make autos oil-free? Well, two-fifths of the energy needed to move a typical car is caused by its weight. And yet over the past decades, uh, <coughs> epidemic obesity has made our two-ton steel autos gain weight twice as fast as we have. Uh, <coughs> but ultralight, ultra-strong materials <coughs> like carbon fiber composites can make dramatic weight-saving snowball 
and can make autos simpler and cheaper to build. Lighter, more slippery autos need less force to move them, so their propulsion system shrinks. And such vehicle fitness uh, then makes electric autos affordable because their batteries or fuel cells get smaller, lighter, cheaper. So the sticker price will fall to about today's level with far lower, lower uh, driving cost. And these innovations can transform automakers from wringing tiny savings out of basically Victorian steel stamping and engine technologies to the uh, steeply falling costs of three uh, mutually reinforcing technologies, learning curves in advanced materials, in their structural manufacturing, and in electric propulsion. Sales can grow and prices drop faster uh, with a temporary fee bait, that is, uh, rebates for efficient new cars paid for by fees on inefficient ones. Uh, in its first two years, the biggest of the five European fee bait programs has tripled the speed of improving automotive efficiency. And the resulting shift to electric autos will be as game-changing as shifting from uh, mechanical typewriters to the Moore's Law-driven uh, uh, dramatic gains in computers. Of course, computers and electronics are America's biggest industry, while typewriter makers have vanished. So vehicle fitness opens a whole new automotive competitive strategy to double our oil savings in 40 years and make affordable the electrification of autos that can save the rest of the oil. Leaders will beat laggards, just like hybrid cars, only faster, because hybrid cars only have one learning curve, not three, reinforcing each other. Now, America could lead this automotive revolution. Uh, currently, the leader is Germany. Uh, this year, Volkswagen announced 2013 mass production of this 230-mile-a-gallon carbon fiber plug-in hybrid, and BMW announced 2013 production of this carbon fiber electric car, confirmed that its carbon fiber was paid for by needing fewer batteries, and said, we do not intend to be a typewriter maker. Audi claimed it's going to beat them both by a year. <clears throat> Even faster and cheaper manufacturing technologies, like the way some of my colleagues made this uh, carbon fiber carbon cap in less than one minute, can scale to automotive speed and cost with aerospace performance and ultimately save four-fifths of automaking's capital needs and, in effect, discover a whole Saudi Arabia of oil savings under Detroit. The same physics and the same business logic also apply to heavier vehicles. Uh, Walmart saved 60% uh, of its heavy truck fleet's fuel over the past five years through better designs and logistics. Just the technological fuel saving in heavy trucks uh, can rise to two-thirds, and combined with uh, nearly tripled to quintupled efficiency airplanes can save ultimately close to a trillion dollars. And today's military revolution in energy efficiency is going to accelerate these civilian savings, uh, much as military R&D has created the internet, GPS, the jet engine, and microchip industries that transformed our civilian economy. Now, as we design and build uh, vehicles better, we can also use them a lot smarter. If this graph of traffic congestion with the peaks in the morning and evening rush hours were an electricity load shape, we would throw a lot of pricing and IT and smart grid stuff at it to try to flatten it out. But by not yet doing this for road traffic, we are wasting many billions of dollars a year through idle people, idle vehicles, and idle roads. Well, now we have four powerful techniques to cut needless driving. We can charge real-time driving costs per mile, not per gallon, and use smart IT to enhance transit and car sharing and ride sharing. We can allow lucrative smart growth real estate models so most people are already where they want to be, <laughs> and we can use IT to make traffic free-flowing. And together, those four proven methods can give us the same or better access with 46 to 84 percent less driving, saving another $0.4 trillion, plus about $0.3 trillion from smarter use of trucks. So 40 years hence, a far more mobile uh, U.S. economy uh, can use uh, no oil and save about $4 trillion. Those 125 to 240 mile per gallon equivalent 
Autos can use any mixture of electricity or hydrogen or advanced biofuels. Trucks and airplanes can realistically use advanced biofuels or hydrogen. Trucks could even burn natural gas, but no vehicles will need oil. Any biofuels the U.S. might need, this little green wedge down here, at most 3 million barrels a day, could be made without displacing cropland. In fact, two-thirds of it comes from waste uh, and without harming climate or soil fertility. Our team speeds up all these kinds of oil savings by what we call institutional acupuncture. We figure out where the business logic is congested and not flowing properly and stick little needles in it to get it flowing, working with partners like Walmart and Ford and the Pentagon. And I think most of the six sectors that need to be transformed are already at or past their tipping point. In fact, a couple of years ago, mainstream analysts started to see peak oil not in supply but in demand. And Deutsche Bank even forecast that world oil use will peak in about another five years. In short, oil is becoming uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. But electrified autos don't have to burn, burden the electricity system. Uh, in fact, when smart autos exchange electricity and information through smart buildings with smart grids, they're adding valuable storage and, re and uh, flexibility resources to the grid that will help it integrate solar and wind power. So electrified autos can actually make the auto and electricity problems e easier to solve together than separately uh, and <clears throat> can converge the oil story with our other big story, uh, saving electricity and then making it differently. And those two transformations in electricity will bring that sector the most numerous and diverse and profound disruptions of any sector as 21st century technology and speed collide with 20th and 19th century institutions, rules, and cultures. Now changing how we make electricity gets a lot easier if we need less of it. Today most of it is wasted and efficiency technologies keep improving faster than they're applied so the potential savings keep getting bigger and cheaper. Uh, over the next 40 years, buildings can triple to quadruple their energy productivity, saving $1.4 trillion net with a 33% internal rate of return. And industry can double its energy productivity with a 21% internal rate of return. There's an even more disruptive uh, innovation we've been hatching called integrative design that can uh, boost those savings further and often make very big energy savings cost less than small or no savings. So you get expanding returns, not diminishing returns. Uh, that is uh, how, for example, our retrofit last year is saving over two-fifths of the energy in the Empire State Building. Remanufacturing its uh, six and a half thousand windows on site into super windows uh, almost perfect in letting in light without heat, uh, plus uh, better lights and office equipment and so on, cut the peak cooling load by a third, and then renovating smaller chillers instead of adding bigger ones saved $17 million of capital cost, which helped pay for everything else and cut the payback to just three years. Uh, <clears throat> Integrative design can also increase the half trillion dollars of conventional energy savings in industry. For example, uh, uh, no, three-fifths of the world's electricity runs motors, half of that runs pumps and fans. Um, and we can save about half of all motor energy with a one-year payback by integrating about 35 improvements. But first, we ought to capture bigger, cheaper savings that are normally ignored. For example, pumps, the biggest use of motors, uh, move... Uh, liquids through pipes in a typical industrial pumping loop was just redesigned uh, to use at least 86% less pumping energy, not by choosing better pumps, but by replacing long, thin, crooked pipes with fat, short, straight pipes. Not new technology, just rearranging our metal furniture. Uh, <clears throat> so what do such savings mean for the electricity that is three-fifths used in uh, motors? Well, from the coal burned in the power plant to the end use, there are so many compounding losses that only a tenth of the coal energy actually comes out the pipe as flow. But now turn those compounding losses around backwards into compounding savings from right to left, and every unit of flow or friction we save in the pipe saves 10 units of fuel and cost and pollution back at the power plant. And as you go back upstream, the components also get smaller, simpler, 
cheaper. Then our team has lately found such snowballing energy savings in over $30 billion worth of industrial redesigns, um, everything from uh, data centers and chip fabs to mines and refineries. Uh, and uh, typically our retrofit designs save about 30 to 60 percent of the energy with a two or three year payback, while uh, in new facilities the savings are 40 to 90 odd percent with lower capital cost. Uh, <clears throat> now, as uh, these kinds of savings uh, efficiency gains in buildings and industry start to outpace economic growth, America's electricity use will start shrinking despite electrified autos. And this will ease and speed the shift to new sources of electricity, chiefly renewables. China is leading their explosive growth and their plummeting cost. In fact, some Chinese solar prices just fell off the bottom of this graph in recent weeks. Solar and wind power are marketplace winners today. Already in about 15 states, private installers, some of them funded now by Google, can put those cheap solar cells on your roof with no money down and guarantee to beat your utility bill. Such unregulated products can deliver a virtual utility that bypasses the power company, uh, just like uh, cell phones have bypassed wireline phone companies. Half of the world's new generating capacity installed in the past three years has been renewable. And last year alone, renewables other than big hydro got $151 billion in private capital. They surpassed global installed nuclear capacity by adding 60 billion watts. That's the same capacity, by the way, as the solar cells that by the end of this year will be manufacturable every year. In contrast, orders for coal and nuclear stations keep fading away because they cost too much and they have too much financial risk to attract investors. Our aging and dirty and insecure electri electricity system has to be replaced by 2050. And whatever we replace it with is going to cost around $6 trillion present value. Whether we buy more of what we've got, or new nuclear and so-called clean coal, or centralized renewables, or distributed renewables. But these four futures differ profoundly in their risks around national security, fuel, water, finance, technology, uh, climate, health. For example, our over-centralized electricity system is very vulnerable to cascading and potentially nation-shattering blackouts, whether caused by solar storms or other natural disasters or cyber or physical attacks by terrorists. But that risk disappears and all other risks are best managed with distributed renewables reorganized into local microgrids that normally interconnect but can stand alone at need. This would cost about the same as business as usual, but would achieve resilience, maximize customer choice and innovation and entrepreneurial opportunity. Now, together, efficient use and diverse dispersed renewable supplies are starting to hurt, turn the whole electricity system on its head. Uh, traditionally, utilities built giant coal and nuclear plants, they built big gas plants, that maybe they bought a little efficiency in renewables, um, and those utilities were rewarded, as they still are in 36 states, for selling you more electricity. But especially where regulators instead reward cutting your bills, utilities and others are starting to buy the opposite. The market is shifting massively towards efficiency, renewables, cogeneration, ways to blend them all together reliably with less transmission and little or no bulk storage. Indeed, four German states last year were 43 to 52 percent wind-powered. And both U.S. and European analyses confirm that 80 to 100 percent renewable electricity is feasible, reliable, and cost-effective. These best buys also turn out to be the most effective solutions for climate change, nuclear proliferation, energy insecurity, and energy poverty. So now let's pull together the oil and electricity revolutions, efficient buildings and factories, savings in directly burned fuel, and we have the really big story, reinventing fire, where business enabled and sped by smart policies and mindful markets can lead the U.S. completely off oil and coal by 2050, saving $5 trillion, much risk and insecurity, and by the way, 82 to 86 percent of fossil carbon emissions. Our energy future is not fate, but choice. And that choice is very flexible. In 1976, for example, government and industry 
both insisted that the amount of energy needed uh, to make a dollar of GDP could never go down. But I heretically suggested it could drop by several fold, and that's what happened uh, by twofold so far. But today's much more powerful technologies, integrated design, maturing delivery channels can do far more, even faster and cheaper. So to solve the energy problem, we just needed to enlarge it. And the results may seem incredible, but you know, as Marshall McLuhan said, only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries are protected by public incredulity. <laughs> well, Rocky Mountain Institute helps smart companies get unstuck and speed this journey. And of course, there's still a lot of old thinking out there. As ex-oilman Morris Strong said, not all the fossils are in the fuel. Uh, but uh, DuPont's former chairman, Edgar Woolard, reminds us that companies hampered by old thinking won't be a problem because he said, ultimately, they won't be around. So what I've described is not just a once-in-a-civilization business opportunity, it's one of the most profound transformations in the whole history of our species. Humans are inventing a new fire, not dug from below, but flowing from above, not scarce, but bountiful, not local, but everywhere, not transient, but permanent, not costly, but free, and but for a little biofuel uh, grown in ways that sustain and endure, this new fire is flameless, efficiently used. It can do our work without working our undoing. Each of you owns a piece of that $5 trillion prize. Our book details how each of you can capture that opportunity. So with the conversation just begun at reinventingfire.com, please join you. We invite you to engage with us, with each other, to help make the world richer, fairer, cooler, and safer by reinventing fire. Thank you.